Yeah. Hi, I'm Caroline Chicoin, and uh, I had the, the privilege and honor of chairing uh, the IRT, which we have five members here today, which uh, I've, I know in an article I was quoted as saying is really was the dream team, and I, and I that that's an understatement. So um, I'd like to introduce uh, to my left here, I'll just go down the, the row here, Russ Pangborn, Associate General Counsel, Trademarks for Microsoft. John Nevitt, Senior Vice President, Network Solutions. Uh, Fabricio Vera, Senior Counsel, Intellectual Property for Time Warner. Jeff Newman, Vice President, Law and Policy for Newstar. And Christina Rosette, Special Counsel for Covington and Burling. Uh, like I said, I chaired the IRT, and I, way back in the beginning days of ICANN, was uh, Names Counsel Representative. Um, for the intellectual property constituency for several years, just in terms of background. Um, one I want to mention before we get started that, um, as we have in our report also, that the members of the IRT are acting in their individual capacities. So to the extent um, that they make statements that are during these sessions, uh, they're made in their individual capacities and should be quoted as individuals unless they otherwise state that they are representing or making statements on their company's behalf. Just to briefly go over the agenda, um, we're going to look at the experience of rights owners and other entities. Uh, we'll look at our mission and, um, and how we operated. Uh, then we'll go straight into the recommendations, uh, which essentially are the IP clearinghouse, the globally protected marks list, and the IP claims. Uh, then the uniform rapid suspension system, known as the URS. The post-delegation dispute resolution mechanism. Uh, thick who is and the expansion of tests for string comparison during initial evaluation and then we'll touch on next steps you'll see in your packet of information uh, that you'll have um, these pages that you can fill out there for basically each of the um, areas uh, the the five recommendations that you can submit you can also submit that anonymously if you want to use those to even ask questions rather than going to the mic um, if you don't feel comfortable either that people will um, attribute those comments to your organization. Uh, you can do it that way, and then we'll have someone come, come by or, or give them to the registration desk, and we'll, we can have those read in as questions or comments during the, the question and answer session. Um, also, for the question and answer session, I just wanted to say that you know we, we want to hear from a lot of different people, so we're, we're just hopeful that people will be sensitive to um, using the mic and, and, and the time that they use are and are allotted so that we hear from a lot of different voices and not, not the same individuals. Um, let's see if there's any other comments. The other thing also is that we, you know, we will not be taking um, process uh, questions, I should say. I mean, if you want to come up and um, you're not happy with the process, how the IRT was formed and, and that sort of thing, that's your prerogative to use your time to do so. Those will get directed to, to ICANN, but the IRT is, is not here to answer questions related to process. Um, we were given a mandate that assumed the rollout of new TLDs, and that's the premise that we started with. Um, doesn't mean that we all agreed with it, but that's what we started with. So we're going to uh, keep our questions to the report and things. So again, if you want to make a comment of record, that's fine, but it won't necessarily be addressed by the IRT team. So without further ado, Will, do you want to do that or do you want yeah, to? Yeah, okay. take it. Is it the right one? It's the green one. Green one? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, there are presently 21 generic top-level domains and somewhere in the neighborhood of 240 country-level domains. And in this environment, cyber squatting is an enormous problem for brand owners and for consumers. Uh, brand owners have spent untold amounts of money and time in policing and defending their brands online. And domain name abuse uh, has become basically a low overhead business with very little barrier to entry with few risks to the bad actors. Uh, with a representative of WIPO here today that's gonna be speaking a little bit later, we thought it'd be appropriate to, uh, uh, I thought it'd be appropriate to quote uh, Francis Gurry from WIPA, who, who had basically said that the sale of, and broad expansion of new TLDs in the open market, if not properly managed, will provide abundant opportunities for cyber squatters to seize old ground in the new domains that are being proposed, which are on the volume of several hundred. 
Uh, rights holders have been frustrated at many levels. Uh, there have been failures at the registrar level with termination and compliance problems. Uh, some CCTLD registries have systematically abused, uh, have been uh, historically systematically abusive. Uh, one that comes to mind is .cm. Uh, serial infringers uh, obviously falsify their who is information, hide behind proxy registration services and prosper from pay-per-click advertising on cyber squatted sites. And they are clearly uh, gaming the system. Obviously, we are looking to prevent consumer confusion going forward. For this to be successful, uh, with protection measures in place, it's not just the rights holders who will benefit. Consumers will benefit from transparency and accountability for the new GTLD space, for it to be safer for all. New registry operators will benefit from operating effective rights protection mechanisms and preventing bad actors and improving consumer confidence. Registrars stand to benefit from standardization and the removal of uncertainty and risk. And ICANN stands to benefit as being sensitive to calls from government, from business owners, and from consumer groups to address this major concern. The formation of the IRT, as Kurt mentioned, happened in the Mexico City, uh, coming out of the Mexico City meetings in March, where the IPC was asked to form the implementation recommendation team. Uh, the IPC put together, uh, under the guidelines, a, an inter internationally diverse group of folks with knowledge, expertise, and experience in the field of trademark, consumer protection, and competition law, and the interplay of trademarks with the internet. And the, the purpose of the group, as was stated, was to develop and propose solutions to the overarching issue of trademark protection in connection with production of the new GTLDs. Without reading you the entire list of IRT members, uh, it's important to note uh, that the members of the IRT spanned North America, Latin America, Asia, Europe, had registry representatives in Jeff Newman and registrar representative in John Nevitt up here with me, uh, plus six ex officio members uh, that included also four from the IPC, including Steve Metallitz, the president, and Intis Claudio de Gangi, both of whom are here today, uh, as well as the ICANN staff. As we were putting together proposals for trademark protection, we decided we needed to have some standard questions to ask to make sure that these protection mechanisms uh, would be effective. The questions that we included were what are the harms that are being addressed by the solution and, and will they scale? Does it accommodate territorial vi variations in trademark rights? Does it conform to extent of actual legal rights? Does the solution work in light of IDNs? To what extent can the solution be gamed and abused? And is it the least burdensome solution? And is it technologically feasible? Also, how will the solution affect consumers and competition? And what are the costs and who's going to pay for them? I want to point out as we start to address the various problems directly, uh, that as Kurt noted, many of the things that are being proposed by the IRT are things that exist today in various forms with existing uh, areas on the internet. So the IP clearinghouse that you'll hear about, for instance, uh, was successfully employed with the .eu and .asia rollouts. Uh, GPML resembles robust reserved names lists on existing CCTLD launches. Uh, the, the uniform rapid suspension system that you'll hear about, as Kurt mentioned, exists in another form. Uh, with nominant in .uk. And then thick who is, of course, is a not very controversial norm in the vast majority of GTLDs. And while uh, some of these recommendations go beyond those precedences, it's worth emphasizing that the implementation of the IRT recommendations generally would not require blazing new trails. With that, I turn it over to my colleagues to address the first problem. Christina? 
Certainly. So one of the first problems that we initially identified as we were sitting, I believe it was as early as our first face-to-face -face meeting in Washington, was assuming that you do have hundreds of new GTLDs being rolled out virtually simultaneously. And let's assume also that there is some kind of pre-launch rights protection mechanism. How on earth can we try and reduce the costs and administrative burden to rights owners of reacting to those rights protection mechanisms? For example, historically, every time there has been a new GTLD uh, rolled out since the .biz and .info, there have been different rights protection mechanisms that require submission of different documents with different date cutoffs, with different uh, identity, identity matching requirements and the like. And trying to keep track of all of those and making sure that the right document goes to the right place at the right time with the right fee is frankly an extraordinarily significant waste of resources. So that was really one of the things that we were trying to solve. And just to give you an example is as we were looking forward, what if you did in fact have all of these 500 registries going live at the same time, they all want the same trademark data validated uh, 500 different times. And in the current scheme, what has happened is that the data has been put provided by the trademark owners to the registrars, which in, in turn have to interact, develop systems that work with the registries. Um, and you could have a situation where you have registrars developing upwards of 500 different processes all at the same time. Um, so the solution that we came up with, the first one, was to create what we have referred to as an IP clearinghouse that would be used to support the new GTLD registries. It would also be used to support several other aspects of the s solutions. And for those of you who've had a chance to read the report, you'll note that we referred to the solutions as really comprising a tapestry and that they're all very interrelated. Mm -hmm. And the IP Clearinghouse is frankly an excellent example of what we mean by that in that it will have different functionality that will enable and facilitate the implementation of various of the solutions. One, for example, would be the globally protected marks list. Another would be IP claims. Another, yet another would be facilitating the implementation of standardized Sunrise eligibility requirements. It's really important to keep in mind as we talk about the IP Clearinghouse that when it comes right down to it, it's really just a database. It's nothing more and there's been some confusion and some uncertainty as to what our intent was. We really are intending to have a database with two principal functions, the first of which being that it would be the centralized entity that all new GTLD registries, and depending upon how it's configured and how each registry goes forward, possibly the registrars, will interact with in relation to the implementation of the globally protected marks list, the GPML, IP claims, and the URS. Um, it would be an information repository for specific information collection and data validation services that could vary on a registry by registry basis. In terms of how we envision it working, the data would be submitted by trademark owners either directly or potentially through the registry or registrar for a fee. The data would be validated by the IP clearinghouse initially or annually. And what we mean by validated, for those of you who may not be familiar with how the ter what the term has come to mean in the RPM context, the rights protection mechanism context, is that the IP clearinghouse, um, the, the entity that would run it would basically say, okay, Christina Rosette claims that she owns U.S. principal register registration number 12345 for mark ABC that issued on such and such a date. I'm going to check and see if the document that she submitted does in fact support that, and if so, it's validated. We're not talking about any um, verification or substantiation or legal analysis of the, of the claimed right. It's really important to note that we're really just talking about a very administrative function of does A match B. Trademark owners would be required, in order for this data to be used, to grant a non-exclusive, royalty-free, sublicensable, very limited sublicensable license to, dat to the data to ICANN, which would, in turn, then grant a sublicense to the IP clearinghouse to enable it to use the data. Um, access to and use of the data would be restricted for the purposes for which it was submitted. That was extraordinarily important to the members of the group. We. Uh, 
discussed extensively how we anticipated this entity interacting with ICANN, and we agreed that it was important that it be an outsourced entity, not currently in a direct ICANN contractual relationship to avoid giving any existing ICANN contracted party a, a competitive advantage over another, and that there would be in a, re, a potentially renewable five-year contract awarded pursuant to an open competitive tender. The idea with the five-year contract is that we realize that there will be significant investment costs at the outset, and really having a contract term of less than five years would probably not make it um, economically viable for anyone to be interested in running it. Equal access to all ICANN uh, registries and registrars would be required. We, we expect that because of how the IP clearinghouse is intended to function, that frankly it will have to be very robust. It's got to be available 24-7, 365. It's got to be scalable and to be able to accommodate records of different types of rights, whether it's identical marks owned by different parties in the same country, across different countries, same goods, different goods, um, and to develop, uh, uh, accommodate all kinds of registered marks, particularly as ICANN moves forward with IDNs, those that are container consists of non-Latin characters. Um, there's been some, at least from some of the comments that have been submitted, there, it appears that there might be a little c confusion or uncertainty is what we mean by this. We're not talking about saying that these are particular rights that the IP clearinghouse will grant or will recognize. We're just saying that the IP clearinghouse has to be designed in such a way so that if a particular registry says, I am only going to grant uh, eligibility and my rights protection mechanism to com individuals or companies that own registered marks for shoes and clothing, that it can do that. Similarly, if, if a country, a registry um, decides that they are in the entertainment field and they want to be able to grant rights to titles of literary works, which are not necessarily protected everywhere, that they would at least have the functionality within the database to allow that. So it's really to be flexible, not to create broader rights. Um, got, it has to be fast, it has to be accurate, it has to really be robust and secure so that you can ensure that the information going back and forth is reliable. The cost to trademark owners needs to be reasonable. We realize that this is um, something that, that is obviously of concern to the trademark community. Um, and that it should be, this cost should be set in such a way so that a trademark owner would not be prohibited by cost reasons from including and submitting data for all of the marks in its portfolio. Fabricio. So the globally protected marks list, uh, I'll refer to it as the GPML going forward. Uh, one of the mandates that we had as the RT was to pull from the public comments that we'd had up to date. One of the most frequently proposed comments from brand owners was what's referred to as a whitelist or a blacklist. Um, we referred to it as the globally protected brands list, with GPML. Um, the, the, the purpose for the GPML really is uh, not a famous marks list. It really is a criteria-based list. It's uh, based on the criteria of very strict numbers, uh, both for trademark registrations of national effect in certain countries, and you'll see on the slides, we've, we have number and number, and the reason being we've, we've asked ICANN actually to do uh, some research so that these numbers could actually be flushed out, and we didn't want to just come up with arbitrary numbers. Um, but you, we'd, we have the list on criteria based on both uh, registrations of trademarks, national effect. Um, they'd have to be across certain regions, certain number of regions. Um, we'd have to have uh, registrations uh, for your marks in the domain name is one of the things to propose. So if your mark is Delta, you'd have to have Delta.com uh, to be able to qualify. And um, all of the registrations at issue would have to have been issued prior to the date of launch. So we've put down November 1st, obviously, that would be flexible and could move and slide depending on when the actual launch of the TLDs went forward. So the way the GPML works, there's uh, two functions, both at the top level and the second level. Um, it works much in the same way that the ICANN proposed list of certain terms like ICANN and IANA would be blocked. Um, at any time that somebody applied for a top level, the top level string would be compared to 
the marks on the global protected list, the GPML. Um, if there is an identical match, then the application would initially fail. There would be a ability to do reconsideration. Um, to prevail under reconsideration, you'd, you'd have to show that there really is no confusion with the brand or that you have some sort of legitimate purpose. Uh, the example that we've used and we've heard often would be Apple. So assuming that uh, someone came out and, and applied for .apple and assuming that Apple met the criteria for the GPML, the application would initially fail. The applicant could then come back and say, no, I am for the Apple Growers Association, or I want to talk about Apple recipes and let everybody, you know, uh, set up websites in that, in that area, um, in which case the applicant would be given the name. Um, we think that this is a really good function in that historically what ends up happening is brand owners uh, are forced to actually register for every single iteration of their brand. Apple would be one of them. You could imagine that Apple Corporation, you know, Apple Computer Inc. would, would go out and register for uh, Apple possibly, and it kind of takes it off the market for everybody else. It's not necessarily always used by someone like Apple. They just do it defensively. In this instance, what you have is the ability to actually have a reconsideration so that legitimate users actually have, uh, uh, can, can get to the space. At the second level, what you have on the GPML is also an initial block, again, what the applicant is able to do is go in for reconsideration. It's a reconsideration by uh, a neutral third party. And the standard that's used under reconsideration is the same types of standards that you would find today, uh, or at least we, we recommend it, the same types of standards that you would find today under the UDRP. Uh, under the UDRP, when someone brings a claim, um, there are certain, um, under 4C of the UDRP, there are certain uh, statements that a registrant can make to show that they have either uh, legitimate or fair use uh, rights to the name, and those are the same types of standards that would be used upon reconsideration. Again, it, it gives a real safety to uh, brand owners because they don't have to go out and defensively register every single uh, mark that they have, but it also allows consumers to have uh, access to some viable space. Uh, again, historically, our companies and other companies go out and have to register every single one of these marks, and some of them may have uh, alternate purposes. Again, the Apple example. Apple Computer Inc. will go register apple.web to make sure somebody else doesn't get it. Um, but the, the Apple Growers Association, the Apple Cookbook people, they're never going to get access to that space. In this instance, you get access to that space if you can prove you have a legitimate purpose, but the brand owner again gets some assurance because it goes in with the registration that the way that the applicant was granted the domain was to show a fair use. And the brand owner can always come back and say, hey, listen, you got this because you, you gave certain representations and warranties. One thing, Fabrice, I just want to comment just that at the top level that the GPML is in addition to uh, what ICANN has already provided in the DAG for the legal rights objection process so that it doesn't supplement, it's in addition to. Correct. So if your brand didn't make the GPML list, you still have all, all the rights that are granted in the, the DAG um, and you have every right to object because of your brand. Thanks, Jeff. Sure. So uh, the IP claim service is um, at the second level and we're talking about a pre-launch mechanism. Um, it is uh, intended to be the, the minimum rights protection mechanism that's adopted at the second level. So if, if someone didn't, for example, want to adopt a Sunrise, um, you know, they could go with a minimum of the IP claims uh, service. And it's also for, it's, it's not just, it's not for marks that are on the GPML, it's for, um, intended for uh, any mark, uh, a registered trademark could be used for the intellectual uh, property claims service. Um, Again, it, what this service really is, and there's more detail about it in the report, but just to kind of summarize, uh, it's where the registry provides notices to potential registrants for domain names that are identical matches to marks contained in the IP clearinghouse. So if someone applies for, um, let's say Apple's, in this instance, is not on the GPML, um, and, and so if Apple uh, computers files for uh, the IP claim service, 
then, and someone applies for Apple, the, the person who applies for the apple.web in this example would get a notice back from uh, the registry or the clearinghouse. There's different implementation mechanisms that could be employed. But essentially, the registrant would get a message saying, look, you've applied for apple.web. Please note that Apple Computer has put in an intellectual property claim on Apple, and that if you proceed to registration, then uh, you may be subject to a number of the dispute resolution processes, including the URS, which will be talked about in a few minutes. Uh, it doesn't, it's important to note that it does not prevent the prospective registrant from registering the name. All it does is provide notice to the potential registrant that these claims are um, there and basically proceed at your own caution. Uh, again, the, the IP claim service also, in addition to providing the registrant, notice. If the registrant proceeds with the application and says, well, okay, I'm aware of those rights that are out there, um, it will uh, notify, first it will notify the uh, trademark owner that, um, that someone has gone through with the registration of that. So Apple Computer would be notified that this other applicant has gone through uh, and, and with, the, with the registration. In addition, uh, and one thing I forgot to mention, is that when the applicant decides to go through with the registration, there are a number of representations and warranties that are, are made by the prospective registrant, similar to the representations and warranties that it would already make in a, in a normal registration agreement, but it just puts it more upfront and center uh, and, and less, or I should say, um, you know, a lot of times prospective applicants or registrants don't really read necessarily the registrar agreements, but it's certainly um, makes it known that uh, the, these reps and warranties are straight up front. And I also want to emphasize, again, this is pre-launched. We've gotten a bunch of comments that I've seen that uh, are saying it's not implementable because it's post-launch. This is, again, intended as a pre-launch mechanism. I suppose if a registry can figure out how to do it after launch and they want to voluntarily do it after launch, I suppose they could try to figure out a way to do that. And then we go to the next Papisha. problem. <clears throat> so the second problem we've seen as brand owners is with 21 GTLDs, uh, there's continuing cyber squatting. Uh, consumers are constantly misled. And the only remedies that we have or recourse that, that brand owners have is to either go to courts or go through lengthy processes, which, which cost a lot of money. And, and I understand that that's not the most um, popular uh, summary when you say it costs us a lot of money, but in some, uh, the, the problem with these things is that they're, they're often very obvious infringements, uh, things that don't require lengthy processes and don't require uh, you know, a, ton of, a ton of consideration, which, which normally we have to go through. Um, and unfortunately, it's not really just the money that the brand owners have to pay, but it's the brand owners' consumers, your consumers, who actually end up paying. And, some examples that we put up on the board here, um, cnnporn.com is something we just recently dealt with, uh, obviously using CNN porn to show porn. Uh, this other user, and I've been asked the question, well, that's not necessarily an infringement, uh, also had hbovoyeur.com based on the HBO brand and a popular HBO show, uh, also for uh, porn PPCs. Uh, Facebook.ie, uh, misspelling of pokemon.com that was just pornography and PradaBaby.net, which was child porn. Child porn. Um, interestingly enough, again, back to the consumers, is that uh, the misspelling of Pokemon, it was discovered by a 10-year-old girl who brought it up to her parents. Uh, parents contacted the brand owner, and then, of course, the brand owner had to go back through and take care of the issue through the process we have today. <clears throat> so what you're going to hear now are some proposals on how to quickly deal with some of these very obvious issues. Okay, so this is uh, to resolve that problem. The IRT recommends a, a uniform rapid suspension system, a, or URS, as it's um, been coined. Uh, again, the process is to address the substantial number of current UDRP cases that go unanswered. Apparently, 70 percent, at least we understand that 70 percent of uh, the UDRP cases um, are clear-cut cases, and the, there's never an answer. And to make it a little um, less expensive for the brand holders and a little quicker process, uh, we recommend the URS. Um, it, it's 
different than the, the UDRP in a number of instances, uh, and one we point out here is that the remedy does not require tra uh, transfer or acquisition of the domain name. We'll talk more about that in a bit. Uh, so the recommendation includes a neutral URS provider appointed by ICANN or providers. Uh, the pre-registration of rights uh, available to uh, trademark holders via the IP clearinghouse. Uh, upon initiation of a URS, the domain name would be um, frozen for transfers. Um, that doesn't mean that the website still won't resolve. It still will resolve or would resolve. Um, but it would be frozen so the... Uh, so the site can't be transferred away. Um, there'll be obviously a notice of the URS complaint by an email and then a registered letter and then another email. Uh, fax was being considered um, through some, some research. Um, and then the burden of proof on the complainant is much higher in a URS than a UDRP. In a UDRP, uh, you use a preponderance of the evidence standard where the standard in a uh, URS would be clear and convincing evidence that there is no contestable issue. And this, the intent of the group was clearly to uh, um, deal with the slam dunk cases. That the, the case is just so clear, the registrant's not gonna bother answering, and uh, that's what's hap happening today in the, in the system. And uh, again, provide a quicker, um, cheaper way for uh, brand holders to protect their rights. Um, upon a, a, one big change that uh, occurred between um, our two reports is that every complaint will go to an examiner uh, who will look at um, the merits of the of the case, regardless of whether an answer is filed or not. Um, upon a decision of the examiner in favor of a complainant, the domain name is frozen. Uh, at the registry, and then the DNS record associated, associated with the domain name is updated to redirect web traffic to a website with a standard URS process page. Essentially, that means that um, the website would resolve to a, a, a standard error message that's hosted by the, uh, the third-party provider. Um, doma domain names are never transferred under the URS, so it's a clear distinction for, from the UDRP. If a brand holder wants the domain name, they have to go to the UDRP. If it's a close case, they have to go to the UDRP. URS is for slam dunk cases where you, you just want to take down the name. Um, some of the protections that were built into the uh, recommendation to uh, protect against misuse or aggressive trademark holders. Um, Again, it's a takedown and not a transfer, so it's not, there's no reverse hijacking risk. Um, notification, email, and certified letter. So you have, you have both those metho methods. Again, facts being examined. Um, all complaints reviewed by an examiner, even if the registrant does not answer. Uh, complainants must agree to indemnify third parties based on the representations in the complaints. Complainants subject to a ban if they abuse the system uh, by filing three abusive complaints. Um, and then there's a, a, appellate rights, rights to uh, appeal. And um, let's say there's a, a default situation where there's no answer from a registrant and then um, they come back and, and realize that their domain name um, wasn't resolving anymore and they file appeal. The day they file the appeal, the, the website, the old website would come back up pending uh, resolution of the, of the URS. So I'm, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions during the question uh, and answer period, but that, that's the overview of the uh, URS recommendation. And uh, back to Russ. Thank you. Uh, the next problem we were looking at was in the post-delegation time period, uh, where we are trying to address what to do with registry operators who act inconsistently with uh, representations they have in the regist registry agreement. Uh, or if they are uh, acting in bad faith with an intent to profit from systemic cyber squatting. And to uh, use the example that has already been used several times in the dot apple scenario, it would be the, the situation that Fabricio had mentioned where the Apple Growers Society of the state of Washington decides to go after dot apple and verifies that they're going to use it for the purposes of the apple growers. Um, and is able to get dot apple on that basis 
uh, it'll be built into their agreement. And then a year later, uh, they decide that it's actually not a very profitable space and start selling iPod.Apple or iMac.Apple and start allowing for use in, in software and computer space. And it's at that point where we were looking to try and build something into the system to address it. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff. Sure, if we can, sorry, that's good, oh, there we go. So the IRT is recommending a post-delegation dispute resolution mechanism, probably not uh, one of the most commented on proposals uh, by the IRT, although there were, there were some uh, comments that were, that were received. Uh, again, it, it was uh, based on a WIPO proposal that I'm sure uh, Brian will talk about from, from WIPO's perspective to, to tackle the uh, breach of any rights protection mechanism or bad faith intent to profit from registration of infringing domain names. The IRT sought to limit the possibility of systemic abuses by, as Russ said, bad actor registry operators. It's not intended to go after, and I'll say this a couple times during the presentation, it's, it's not intended to go after the registry that merely performs its function as a registry. In other words, that doesn't have some bad faith intent to profit off of systemic cyber squatting. It's not intended to go after those registries. We all know that there are infringing domain names within our, our space, but the role of a registry uh, is, is not one that has a direct contract with the ultimate registrant, and therefore is not expected to actively monitor all of the domain name registrations within that TLD for potential infringement. So in this post-delegation dispute resolution mechanism, the first thing the IRT notes is that the third party can submit a claim directly to ICANN on one of the three grounds that we'll uh, address in the next slide. ICANN is, is then responsible for investigating that uh, alleged claim, and, and uh, the IRT fully expects that uh, ICANN uh, will do its job and will fully investigate those matters. And if it does find a breach of the actual contract, that they will take advantage of the various enforcement mechanisms that are built into the contract. And on that note, the IRT recommended that uh, ICANN put in additional enforcement mechanisms than what were in the initial draft applicant guidebooks base contract uh, that they put out. And some of those enforcement mechanisms resemble those that are in the newly uh, approved registrar accreditation agreement, which uh, a number of registrars were happy to note have signed uh, and are now uh, governed under, including uh, Network Solutions, John's uh, registrar. Uh, if the claim is unresolved, in other words, ICANN cannot necessarily find that there was in fact a breach, uh, or that the trademark, or there's just nothing done on it to the trademark owner's satisfaction, then the, the third party, the intellectual property owner, can initiate the post-delegation dispute process. And what that will entail is a, a fairly uh, comprehensive arbitration type process where there will be an investigation done by the, the neutral third party. The three applicable disputes that the IRT recommended, the first one is, is really kind of the one that Russ addressed and the, and the one that's the example that was on the previous slide. And it's where the manner, operation, or use of the top level domain is inconsistent with the representations in the top level domain application. And the operation or use of that TLD is likely to cause confusion with the complainant's mark. So in layman's terms, pretty much that's the, the Russ example that he mentioned, the Apple example, uh, where someone initially in Apple Growers gets through all the uh, rights protection mechanisms at the top level and is able to uh, have the TLD for dot .apple, and then all of a sudden, as Russ said, they decide one day they're not making money, and now they want to allow software.apple or iPod.apple, and, and now the you know Apple Computers is uh, wants to to make sure that this doesn't happen. The second uh, applicable dispute is where there's a breach of the rights protection mechanisms in the agreement, and such breach is likely to cause confusion with the complainant's mark. So there are obligations currently in the IRT recommendation that require, for example, in the URS, that uh, the registry take down names or you know goes through all that steps. But let's say the registry doesn't do what it, it's supposed to be doing. Again, this would be a mechanism whereby the third party can raise this to ICANN and ultimately, if not satisfied with ICANN's, uh, either ICANN doesn't act uh, or uh, ICANN doesn't find conclusively a breach, the third party can bring the action. 
The third applicable dispute, which is probably the one on this proposal that's raised the most comment, is that the manner or operation or use of the top level domain exhibits a bad faith intent to profit off of the systemic registration of domain name registrations therein, which are identical or confusingly similar to the complainant's mark. So I'm going to stop there and, and emphasize again, it is for A, where there's a uh, bad faith intent to profit shown by the registry operator, and B, where there's a um, systemic cyber squatting. So it's not for a case where there's a couple names let's say, that are infringing. It's not to go after the registry operator for that scenario. It's uh, unless the registry operator is otherwise profiting off of it. And there was an example mentioned with, uh, or that's been mentioned in comments, uh, where there was in one instance a, a top level domain that was alleged to have entered into a contract with a domainer to uh, register a bunch of marks in that domain that did not qu otherwise qualify under the charter. And, and those names, a number of those names were actually cyber squatting. So uh, the, the other three elements uh, that, that have to be shown when you make this is that, the, um, that what's going on within the registry is actually taking advantage, un either taking unfair advantage of the reputation of the complainant's mark. So it's not to give general standing to anyone in, in the world. It's really intended to give standing. In other words, a party that can bring this claim is really the one that's actually harmed by it, either because they're taking advantage of the complainant's mark, um, or that they're impairing the reputation of the complainant's mark, or creating an impermissible likelihood of confusion with the complainant's mark. So this third ground is not, let's say, in the most egregious example, it's not for a competitor to bring this claim. You know, that's not actually harmed by it. So let's say that there was a, um, a dot uh, web and then someone else has a dot internet. I'm making that up. I don't know if someone would actually do that. Uh, let's say that there's a uh, cyber squatting that's going on for in dot web and dot internet it views themselves as a competitor. It's not for dot internet to bring up this claim. It's for someone that's actually harmed by the, the cyber squatting. Uh, the decision, so this will go before a third party, and again, it, it's envisioned not necessarily, a, it, it's not going to be a cheap process, it's one that's pretty comprehensive, and the possible decisions, the panel can find for the complainant, can find for the registry operator, and also provide a recommendation for a, a remedy. So in other words, the panel could say, yes, we do believe that the registry operator violated its contract, and we recommend that I can do one of a number of things that are actually in the registry agreement. So we recommend that I can uh, suspend the registry from taking new registrations until it cures its breach. We recommend that there's some sort of monetary fine. Uh, or, or there's also special circumstances where there could be group liability. For example, if the registry is affiliated with the registrar that's committing some of the, uh, these acts, or ultimately, in the worst case scenario, if this is not the first time, but happens to be the third, three or more times, then it could recommend termination of the ICANN agreement. The IRT tried to balance the concept of, uh, you know, if a complaint is, CRT was very worried about uh, tr aggressive trademark owners bringing actions that didn't necessarily have merit. So there are mechanisms like recommended in the U.S. that actually uh, grant monetary fines for an aggressive trademark owner who will have to pay more if they're found, uh, if the complaint is found to be without mer merit. Similarly, there is a mechanism in there to impose fines on registry operators that put forth a really uh, uh, a defense that really lacks any kind of merit at all. Uh, we talked about the enforcement tools and the fees that are being proposed by the IRT. And again, there's a schedule, a fee schedule that's recommended as an example in the IRT report, but none of us did a business case analysis to see whether these would actually be the fees that it would cost to do this. We just wanted to point out that it's a substantially high fee, uh, substantially higher than, a, let's say, a URS or even a UDRP. And again, we were trying to balance uh, basically the right of a third party to bring these actions, but also not to encourage aggressive trademark owners to necessarily bring these actions as just, you know, who can I go after with, this, with the, deeper, the deeper pockets. So I think I'm also yep. for problem four, although... Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So problem four is that, uh, you know, one of the situations that trademark owners and, and frankly consumers and others find themselves in is that there's no single source of data 
uh, in this case, who is data that, that one could turn to. So if, for example, it's a thin registry like .com or .net, a trademark owner would have to go to the registry, find out who the registrar is, and then check that registrar's who is. Uh, in the last few years, although ICANN has gotten better in enforcement, there's certainly been a number of registrars that don't uh, necessarily have their who is data that's uh, readily available. Uh, and so the IRT is recommending, and in fact, it's actually recognized in, uh, I will call it the draft applicant guidebook version 2.5 <laughs> that uh, ICANN put out a couple weeks before the Sydney meeting that uh, it's, it's uh, and I guess I'm talking about the solution now, so I'll go to that slide, recommended a thick who is for all new GTLDs. I will note for the record that it's important that every single new TLD with the exception of dot jobs is actually a thick registry. So in total, every single GTLD with the exception of com, net, and jobs has a thick registry. And our recommendation is not necessarily that, uh, well, let me put it another way. The recommendation is not for any registry operator to act inconsistent with the law. So if it is the law of their jurisdiction and there is a process, a consensus policy process that was adopted several years ago for a registry operator to bring that issue forth to ICANN, the IRT is not recommending that anyone violate the law or that ICANN put out uh, a require in its contract that anyone violate the law. What we're saying is that in jurisdictions uh, where this is not an issue, that they not only collect the thick, uh, all of the display information, the thick who is, but also, um, not only collect it, but also display it. And what thick who is, for those of you in the room that, do that doesn't necessarily understand the difference between thick or thin, right now in a thin registry, uh, the registry only collects certain limited set of information that does not involve the contact information of the registrant, administrative contact, technical contact, and in some instances, billing contact. The registry collects from the registrar the information about uh, who the registrar is, the creation date of the registration, the name server information, really the, the basic information that you need to actually have a domain name go into DNS and resolve. Uh, but the thick who is adopted by biz, info, and, and like I said, every new GTLD since, um, since Comnet and org, and even org now is a thick registry. It's basically to also collect and display information about the registrant, the admin contact, and the technical contact. So uh, I also want to so emphasize, we are not saying, I could say this 100 times, but I've seen this in the comments, even from people that have heard this, we are not saying to go out and violate the privacy laws of any country. We're not saying uh, that uh, you're required to, that ICANN is required to put into its contract that people do this. What we're saying is that for jurisdictions where this is allowed uh, to actually display this information. The other thing that the IRT recommended, which was actually in the COM and NET agreements in uh, the 2001 COM and NET agreements, but not necessarily in the 2006, was that ICANN work to establish a centralized who is system so that uh, IP owners or consumers or anyone using law enforcement, anyone that uses the who is, could go to a centralized source to find information on all the GTLDs as opposed to going to, um, if there's 500 registries, as opposed to going to each one of the 500 to find out uh, the information. Okay, and then we're gonna look, we just have a couple more slides, so if, Kurt, if you don't mind, we'll go, since we started a little late, we'll just go an extra minute and then we'll go ahead and break for the coffee. Christina? Sure. Um, the, the fifth problem that we identified, and, and for those of you who may not be as familiar um, with what's currently in the draft applicant guidebook, is that in the initial examination process, um, it is currently ICANN's intent that applied for strings will be compared against uh, ICANN reserve names, um, existing TLDs, um, only for visual similarity. For those of you with trademark background know that traditionally the trilogy for confusion, assessing whether or not there is in fact a likelihood of confusion is sight, sound, and com commercial impression. It became pretty clear to us pretty early on that when we started uh, running tests of the string confusion algorithm that ICANN has developed and intends to use, that it was generating a lot of false positives. And so what we have, um, and we've identified one here, for example, under this assessment, dot tell could end up blocking dot hotel on visual similarity grounds. Obviously, when you do the full trilogy, you're really 
is no likelihood of confusion there. So what our solution was that you would use the algorithm. We're basically taking what ICANN is proposing and taking it one step further. That the algorithm would be used to identify strings that are visually similar. And that once that, whatever that threshold is that ICANN intends to use is met, at that point, similarity in sound and meaning is also considered. We are not recommending that similarity in sound and be meaning be considered from the outset. It's only if the visual similarity threshold is met. Um, and in that case, we recommend, consistent with our broader recommendation on the GPML, that all applications that would fail the string confusion portion of initial evaluation be given the opportunity for reconsideration. Under the current version of the draft applicant guidebook, if your application fails that test, your application is rejected. So we believe that combining this next step with regard to the algorithm as well as the process for reconsideration, frankly, makes the process more fair, more balanced, and is ultimately more likely to lead to a greater number of strings making it through the process. Uh, there were other concerns that we identified based on the comments, uh, which was, as, as I believe someone has mentioned, what we started with in terms of going through the public comments. But we only had eight weeks from start to finish, um, and we realized very early on that we had to prioritize. So some of the things that we didn't get to, but that we thought were, frankly, important and important enough to make sure that we kind of put the marker down on behalf of the IRT are, are things such as development of universal standards and practices for proxy domain services. Um, that applicants be allowed to apply for more than one character string in an application. Um, for example, if I, I were to apply for dot .toys, that I could apply in ASCII and Kanji or Arabic or Cyrillic, that rather than having to file multiple applications for essentially the same string in different characters. Um, in short, I would just say that given the time constraints that we were under and the fact that, that <laughs> we all have other jobs, um, it, there really was a limit as to what we could do. And we really recognize that our work is not perfect, it's not complete, but we really do hope that the recommendations that we put forward are a step forward uh, in terms of providing technically feasible, fair, and affordable solutions that would be applicable globally so that uh, new GTLDs could go forward in an environment um, that is not going to be conducive to rampant trademark abuse. And I'll just, I'll just add, I think that if, you know, at this stage, if you still haven't really read the report from first page to last, including all the footnotes, um, that you do so. Uh, because I think, you know, there's a lot of us relying on kind of people to summarize things in various um, literature and things. And you'll see that a lot of the comments even that we saw to the report were things that we did consider and either because we were advised that it weren't technologically feasible or weren't practical. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things that are being thrown around that, that actually were, we spent a lot of time debating and things. And, and we tried to document as much of that, like I said, is, is, is in, in the footnotes. Um, so if you haven't done so, I encourage you to, to go there and, and read it firsthand. Um, with that, I guess we'll go ahead and take our break. I'll, Kurt. Yeah, first, um, nah. Um, I, I, uh, first, I really want to thank the members of the IRT. I've done this a few times in, in public already, and so have other members of the ICANN staff and the ICANN community. But um, while uh, it's not um, thrilling to listen to every minute, it's certainly thrilling for those who are attempting to protect the rights of their clients and see a lot at stake in this, and that it's very important work. And um, there's a tremendous amount of significant and meaningful work that's been done. So um, I just want to, I'm going to clap and you can clap. And 